Welcome to a special forum with Sister Joan Chittister, broadcast from Westminster Presbyterian Church in beautiful downtown Minneapolis on Nicollet Mall, and sponsored by Women's Spirit and the Westminster Town Hall Forum. My name is Tim Hart Anderson. I'm the senior minister at Westminster Presbyterian Church and moderator of this event. It is my pleasure to introduce tonight's guest speaker. Sister Joan Tittister is widely recognized as one of the most influential religious leaders and social analysts of our time. She's a member of the Benedictine Sisters of Erie, Pennsylvania, and the founder and executive director of Bennett Vision, a resource and research center for contemplative spirituality. She's the author of more than 40 books on religion, spirituality, peacemaking, and social justice, and she writes a regular column from where I stand for the National Catholic Reporter. She currently serves as the co-chair of the Global Peace Initiative of Women, a partner organization of the United Nations, which facilitates a worldwide network of women peace builders. She served as president of the Leadership Conference of Women Religious and was part of the Interfaith Council convened by theologian Karen Armstrong to draft the Charter for Compassion, which was disseminated worldwide. Her topic tonight is American women and the women of the world, no woman left behind. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Sister Joan Tittister. And a beautiful introduction. Uh, I, I don't pay a lot for those either, but um, <laughs> uh, but I do. When I hear one like that, I I wish to God my mother were still alive. <laughs> <laughs> She'd believe it. <laughs> we we tell one though, Pastor at home, that I I prefer if you don't mind. We talk about. Uh, uh, tell the story about a priest and a rabbi who went to a prize fight together. And when the little Jewish kid got in the ring, he jumped up and down, he flexed his muscles, he beat on his chest, and he went to his corner. When the little Catholic kid got in, he jumped up and down, he flexed his muscles, he beat on his chest, and he made the sign of the cross. The rabbi looked at the priest and he said, is that going to help him? And the priest said, only if he can fight. <laughs> So I want to thank you for trying, Pastor, but I'm, <laughs> I'm on my own now. I've been thinking about you a lot. You won't be surprised to hear that because uh, I, I know the reputation of this forum, and most of all, I know the thoughtful reputation of its, of its audience. And I said to myself, well, you know, well, what, what, what else, what else can, can you say? And then I came across this story, and I discovered that there were things left to say. <laughs> There's a, there's a story we tell back in Pennsylvania about a little girl camel who said to her mother, Mother, she said, I, I don't quite understand what, what we camels are. And, and I, oh, could you help me? I, and for instance, Mother, what, why, why do camels, why do we camels have, have webs between our toes? And the mother camel said, well, darling, that's so that when we walk through the desert, we won't sink into the sand. Because at all, she said, "Oh, that's well, well, mother. Could you tell me why we have such long eyelashes?" And the mother camel said, "Well, well, darling, there are a lot of sandstorms in the desert, and and with the long eyelashes, our our eyes are protected." Little girl said, "That's good. That's really good." And she said, "I just have one more question, mother. Could you tell me why camels have humps on our backs?" And she said, "Yes, dear." She said, "That's so." that when we're, we're in the desert, we can walk from one side to the other and have enough water for the journey. The girl said, really? Mother said, yes. She said, well, mother, if we have, if we're, have web toes so we don't sink into the sand, and long eyelashes so our eyes don't get hurt from the sand, and, and humps on our backs so we have enough water to cross the desert, could you tell me what the devil we're doing in the San Diego Zoo? <laughs> Now, you know why I admire 
you so much for treating, being willing to treat this topic tonight. This forum on the role and place of women, both in America and around the world, is an important event. I beg you to believe that for all of us, both women and men. This is not a woman's issue. This is a human issue. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, it's a truth test. The fact is that the import of this subject far exceeds the boundaries of this place and our homes and our private lives. And it is meant to offer some fresh perspective on attitudes that linger toward women. And it tests the truth and the reality of what we ourselves say about our own commitments to equality and justice and human development. The question tonight is simply whether or not we ourselves really grasp its importance and so are determined to make it significant for others as well. As I prepared this presentation, I found myself coming back again and again to two other stories that confirm, I think, these values. The first story is from a folk tale. Old woman, a young woman asked, tell me, what is a woman's greatest burden? And the old woman answered, young woman, the greatest burden a woman has is to have no burden to carry at all. That answer comes out as a, the wail of a woman who knows what it is to suffer under a system which she herself has had no opportunity, no right to reframe or reshape to her own values or vision. The second story comes from the Sufi. Once upon a time, a wealthy merchant went from bazaar to bazaar looking for rugs worthy of adding to his great inventory. And suddenly, there it was. He saw it hanging on the wall of the smallest boutique in the smallest bazaar in the world. And next to the hanging sat a woman on a prayer rug, fingering her beads. He drew up his horse and he shouted at her, Old woman, how much do you want for that rug? That woman never, she never looked up at him. She simply called back, a hundred rupees, sir. The merchant gasped, a hundred rupees for that rug? Absolutely, sir, the old woman said. Old lady, the merchant called back, that is the most beautiful rug that I have seen any place in the entire Middle East. And the old woman said, I know that, sir. And that is precisely why I'm selling it for a hundred rupee and not a single rupee less. But old woman, the merchant cried, if you know how beautiful your rug is, why in the name of Allah are you selling it for only a hundred rupee? And then the old woman looked up. And there was a sad and a shocked look on her face. Because, sir, she said to him, until this moment, I never knew there were any numbers above 100. <laughs> it's a tragedy to doom an entire class of people to lives of diminished expectations. But it is immoral to condemn them to lives of unfinished possibilities. Yet for generations, someone somewhere has decided that women need less, that women deserve less, and that women are worth less than the rest of the human race. So as a result, tonight as we sit here considering a subject quite academically, women are two-thirds of the illiterate of the world. Women are two-thirds of the starving of the world. And women are two-thirds of the poorest of the poor everywhere. That can't be an accident. That's a policy. And it must be changed by that other third. As Teilhard de Chardin wrote once, the only thing worthy of our efforts is to construct the future. But on the way to the future, life plays cruel tricks on us all. I, for instance, was raised by a mother who was singularly intelligent and unusually strong. 
Her life lessons to me were very short and very clear. Study, Joan, she said, and you can be anything you want to be. And I believed her. But then I began to discover that that was everywhere a lie. As a small child, I wanted to be a surgeon, and then I learned that only men could be surgeons. Later, I wanted to be an altar server in the church, and I was told that only boys could be on the altar so close to God. And finally, I wanted to be a writer, and discovered that women writers existed, of course, but they were very, very rare on the ground, and they were very, very seldom published. The questions why and why not haunted me. And so over the years, I began an archeological study of the woman's issue. Where did those ideas come from? Who was being advantaged by the repression of women? What did science say about the subject? What did churches say about the subject? What did the law say about the subject? In fact, who was it? who was saying all these things and why. I scoured every discipline that I could read for answers. I turned over every rock, and then I began to realize that everything being said about women were all being said by men. <laughs> about us was written without us. <laughs> Men, I was taught, were God's highest creation. Mm -hmm. And we knew it was true because men told us so. <laughs> so I began to write about the history of ideas about women, about the nature of feminism, about the relationship between theology, ecology, and feminism, about conditions of women in war. And finally, I began to explore the implications of the divine feminine, the notion that woman, too, is made, quote, in the image and likeness of God. I was sure. Correction, I was naive enough to believe that once people understood what had happened and came to understand how we were all, men as well as women, women as well as men, being affected negatively by sexism, the situation would surely end on the spot, I thought, <laughs> with roaring affirmation from all parts of the human condition in both church and state. In fact, even in the church as well as the state, <laughs> at both home and work. And then it dawned. I was wrong. I was clearly wrong. At least if the continuing state of women in the world today, and in the United States as well, is any proof at all of the fact that women are not yet really accepted as full human beings, then I would have to accept that. So finally, there is a third story, a true story, that prods me on despite it, the saddest of all the stories, perhaps. In this story, a mother who worked at a halfway house for battered women came to me disappointed and discouraged after a presentation. Her young daughter, she said, simply rejected out of hand any of her advice on how, as a woman, to negotiate a just salary for herself or how to define the family role relationships between her and her fiance, or listen to her counsel about how to handle abuse if she were violated physically, as are, according to the government, over 25% of the women in the United States. Oh, mother, please don't, the daughter told her. That feminism stuff is so your generation. <laughs> It's passe now, Mother. We don't have those problems oh. anymore. <laughs> really? Well, my, that's the way my parrot talks. Really, she says. <laughs> and I understand every word she's saying. 
Well then, in that case, given the world as it is, where shall we go to determine if feminism is really over or ought to be really over? Is it now passe? Has it been resolved or not? And if not, what does that mean to you and me tonight and for the rest of our lives? My suggestion is that we start by asking women themselves. So let me tell you what I myself have seen or been told by women everywhere around the world or heard from UN workers in the field. For instance, seven months ago, I sat in a tent in Nairobi in March of 2011 while Congolese women told the 100 international delegates there how difficult it was for their country to forgive the atrocities committed there during the war, but especially the crimes against women. Over 70% of the Congolese women and girls, seven out of every 10 groups of Congolese women and girls, the Congolese women told us, had been raped and maimed in military actions that were not yet even identified in the international tribunal as war crimes. One woman described one such act. The soldiers came, she said, broke into the house and demanded that the man turn over his wife and daughters to them or be beaten himself. He refused, so they held the husband down they cut off his fingers one at a time, and they stabbed him repeatedly. His wife was agonized by his suffering. She couldn't stand it any longer, and she begged them to let him go and take her instead. So they did. They gang raped her and her daughters in front of her husband and sons. They robbed the house, and they left. And when the raping robbers left, the husband exploded in anger at her and demanded that she and the girls leave the house immediately and never return. In fact, that woman is wandering homeless tonight as we consider her own situation. That response of the husband's was, they told us, a response so common that now most of the women of the Congo are still homeless, alone, and abandoned by families and husbands everywhere. The international delegates like you at this moment were horrified, totally incredulous. How could these husbands do such a thing? How could their families simply discard them like that? What, we wanted to know, could possibly justify it in a culture that values family so much and in a situation where so many women were laying down their own lives daily to save both their husbands and their daughters? Well, first, one of the Congolese women explained to us quietly, they have not come to understand that women are really human. And then she went on quite cryptically, you see, men have to believe, men have to believe, believe that women don't want it that women are not rapaciously sexual. And so we have to ask ourselves, is that attitude over now? Is it over in the United States? Well, in the United States, men can call women who take contraceptives sluts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or prostitutes who simply want the right to have sex without responsibility. And those men keep their jobs and their professional reputation while the woman struggles to regain hers. Mm -hmm. Clearly, the notion that women want it 
is still a commonplace on which judgments are made and laws are written and, and, and people's lives are shaped. Clearly, a woman's emotional maturity and rational development are still only grudgingly conceded, and we do not know what our boys are being taught in this culture yet. Or let those who think that feminism is over come with me to Mexico and Morocco. In Mexico, Marta, I have her picture in my album, lives in a little shack on the side of a running river latrine with four children and an old sewing machine. She's one of what Mexico calls uh, La Casa Chicas, one of the little love mess, where she hopes for a few pesos a week from the man who comes and goes from her little shack as his fancy dictates. The system has developed, they told us, to satisfy, satisfy a man's sexual appetites, you know, in addition to their wives, you know, get a little boring. There's no legal protection for it or from it, and there's no financial support required. It's simply, they tell us, a sign of the sexual prowess of the man, the score, the conquest. Mm -hmm. And after all, the guide explained to us, it is a source of sustenance for the woman. Oh, In Mexico, international workers tell us only the gradual emancipation of women and its effect on women's education will make it possible for a woman ever to begin to support herself. In fact, the village women that I also talked to at the top of the mountain told us that they were being regularly beaten for going to classes where they could learn to read and write and make products for sale. What's been the happiest day in your life? We asked Marta, simplistically. And she thought for a moment and she said, I don't know. Maybe the day I die. And what sustains situations like these? Only the age-old notion that a woman is meant to be attached to a man, not to support themselves. Is that attitude over and resolved? Is that problem passe? In the United States yet, single women and their children are locked into a low-wage life of disgraceful poverty because a woman's place is in his home, not hers. Clearly, education is everywhere, a key to independence that the work open to poor women does not afford. In Morocco, Article 475 of Morocco's Penal Code allows a rapist to avoid prosecution and prison by marrying his victim. If she is a minor, and to preserve the family honor, her family agrees, then he's free. Since 2006, that government has promised to strike down that law, but nothing has changed. In March of this year, 2012, 16-year-old Amina Falali raped, beaten, and forced to wed her rapist killed herself. And the government of Morocco, under international pressure, issued a statement saying that the relationship was consensual. <laughs> what they did, in other words, was to blame the victim. In the United States, too, mm -hmm. isn't it? Mm -hmm. Blaming the victim is an indoor sport. Mm -hmm. And what kind of thinking sustains a situation like this in what we like to call the civilized world. Simple. If violence happens to you tonight, it's because you either permitted it or provoked it. When you were, when you were beaten, were you drinking? Then it's your fault. Did you go home with him voluntarily? Well, then you must have consented. Do you live alone? Oh. You wearing the wrong clothes? Were you nice to him when he spoke to you? Then you led him on. You 
were looking for trouble. Indeed, just like the Congo, they must want it. As Congresswoman Glenn White puts it, rape is a pandemic disease in this country. And we must ask what our boys are still being taught. Clearly, society's double standard for women and men is still very alive and doing quite well. Boys will be boys is the kind of thinking at college administrative levels yet in this country that care more for winning football games than for preserving the integrity of the young women the football team rapes. In Syria and Libya, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, everywhere. It's women and children who are left behind to die from the wounds of war as rampaging men, or worse, perhaps, unmanned drones, shell their houses to dust and then leave that area to kill somewhere else. It's the women and girls who die on the streets without homes and husbands now to go back to, without food and clean water to drink, without family and friends to cling to, without the government support or the jobs and the money it will take to rebuild their shattered lives. In the United States, it is war wives who are left to raise the children their husbands leave behind in houses now that they can no longer pay for, with jobs that pay them less than their male counterparts. <laughs> And when the husband returns from war, also jobless, if they protest the inequality in wages or the lack of employment and promotion opportunities left for a woman, for a woman who is now the sole support of her families, if they, if they protest the lack of what it takes to do it, the final indignity must surely be to have other women, young women, who have yet to face the closed doors of the corporate world that doles out unfair wages to women to criticize as old, passé, feminist foolishness <laughs> their struggles to be heard and to be treated as fully human. And clearly worse is the fact that in modern warfare, where weapons of mass destruction show no favorites, between the warriors and the ward upon. There is no such thing as non-combatants. And women and children everywhere in this world, not soldiers, are now, as a result, over 90% of the victims of war. In a world in which the struggle for equality is to some privileged women, so yesterday, so passe, I've never been oppressed. So the last generation's problem, not ours. The cries of women who are still struggling against discrimination in the marketplace go unheard. The attitude of women who have jobs toward those who don't or who must work two jobs without benefits to get one full job's pay is the very attitude that has always sustained racism and poverty as well. If they just... If they just work harder, we were told, they can get ahead, I did. Despite the fact that the ceiling on wages and promotions is immoral, but not yet illegal. <laughs> Clearly, sexism in the workplace is a given. Until women are as concerned about other women's jobs as they are about their own, their own are eternally in jeopardy. In 28 countries of the world, 100 to 140 million young girls, 2 million a year, 6,000 a day. As we sit here, it's going on have been subjected to pharaonic clitoridectomies, the excision of a woman's genitalia to control a woman's raging sexual drive, mm -hmm. and increase her husband's sexual pleasure, 
and guarantee her sexual purity before marriage. The World Health Organization says the side effects of, of this barbaric practice include severe pain, abscess, hemorrhage, infection, infertility, incontinence, and would we doubt it, psychological and sexual problems. But those who advocate it, and there are many, say that it is a divine mandate because the sexual satisfaction of the husband is God's will for women. Though nowhere, nowhere in any basic religious document is that written in any tradition. A woman's body, in other words, is shaped by man's interest. In the United States, the diet industry, the clothing industry, the cosmetic industry, a large part of the bodybuilding industry, and a large part of elective plastic surgery does the same. Our girls are being disfigured or die too. Some of our brightest women have already gone that way, like Karen Carpenter and Princess Diana, like Muriel Hemingway and Nadia Comaneci, like young dancers and figure skaters and gymnasts and models everywhere, all in pursuit of the male defined body. And they're dying from anorexia and bulimia and from the depression that comes from hating the way they look mm -hmm. and the feeling of not looking good enough to meet the male standard of female beauty. And in 1995, the United States Congress approved pharaonic clitoridectomy in this country. Yes, in practice here. And though women activists are making an attempt to have that changed, it has never been picked up by anybody in the Senate or Congress. When did you write your last postcard about it? Surely, no religious, moral, or cultural argument is ever moral if it endangers human rights and full physical development, if it blocks a woman's moral agency or denies her the fullness of her humanity, if it ignores the free consent of the woman whose life will be forever changed by it. That is, as Norway's ambassador to the United Nations says, the real moral hazard of our time. Clearly, the sexualization of women is the fundamental measure of women's humanity everywhere. Trust me, for those women, feminism is not passe. It is not to be ignored, and it is not to be abandoned. Women who comprise more than 50% of the agricultural workforce in a world badly in need of food for the 925 million undernourished poor of the world are unable to produce it because women are restricted from buying, selling, or inheriting either land or livestock. Women in Cameroon and in Kenya, Nigeria, and Tanzania are doing 75% of the agricultural work of the country but they own less than 10% of the farmland. So they can't grow more crops or grow more income. In Southeast Asia, women are respons responsible for 90% of the rice production. But in India, Nepal, and Thailand, they own less than 10% of the land. In Namibia, a woman still loses all her livestock if her husband dies. Gender bias, in other words, is condemning millions of boys and girls to grow up hungry with all the physical and mental stunting that implies. Gender equity in this realm alone could reduce malnourishment for a minimum of 150 million people a year. The attitude that undergirds situations like this is simple and straightforward. Business is not a woman's work. Men do those things. Men control those things. Men 
profit from those things. In the United States, the lack of gender equity is cleverly masked, however. Women are hired, but not promoted. Women are 90% of the teachers, but only 10% of the principals, and 5% of corporate leaders. Women are paid, of course, but not fully. In every arena, women are still paid 18 to 25% less than a man for the very same work. Women are uh, uh, admitted to the professions now, yes, but only rarely to executive boards or top management positions or political offices, and then as tokens, never in equal numbers. Who's running your hospitals? Who's running your government? Who's running your colleges? Who's running any of your institutions? Who's running the banks? Who's running the stock exchange? A woman or two here or there. It's, it's a, a, uh, an organizational policy called Add Women and Stir. Gender equity is the bog of gender equality. All the patronizing words in the world do not change the value of a woman's paycheck, despite the fact that a single mother pays exactly the same amount of money for a loaf of bread or a tank of gas or heat for the house or a trip to the doctor's office as any man does. Mm -hmm. Clearly, it's women, not men, whose unpaid work is carrying the world on their economic shoulders. According to the World Economic Forum of 2012, listen carefully, of the top 20 countries on the planet considered best for women, measured by the metrics of health and wellness, education, political empowerment and economic participation, the United States of America ranks 22nd. <laughs> ranks, in other words, after the Philippines, after Lesotho, Latvia, South Africa, and Cuba. So how will we know when we're equal? Easy, I got away. We'll know. <laughs> We'll know that we're finally equal when our klutzes are promoted to high-paying executive positions <laughs> as fast and as equal in number as their klutzes are. <laughs> and yet the statistics are clear. Companies that strike a gender balance all the way up to the management levels do better financially than those that don't. Check the figures. Yes. But we won't get there unless this generation of women, you, refuse to be fooled into thinking that the woman's question is dead and refuse to allow the questions of, of women's human rights to die. Lack of access to clean water affects everyone, of course, but it affects girls most of all, and it gets the least attention from policymakers and male politicians in Mexico. Water is a feminist agenda. The Coca-Cola and the Fanta trucks get to the top of the mountain weekly, but no water truck ever comes. Nor does the government run water pipes up there. It's too expensive to do that, they say. And anyway, they explain to us, they don't need water pipes because they have women to do that task. So Graciela and the other women of the mountain village we were in rise before dawn there. They walk miles up the mountain to the nearest well they carry 10 gallons of water home on their shoulders to do the cooking and the laundry and the personal hygiene for the day. And then in the afternoon, they do it all over again for supper and bathing that night. Day after day after day, 20 gallons of carrying a day from childhood to death every day of their lives. No wonder they're dying so young. What attitudes remain that account 
for this kind of neglect. Easy. Carrying water is a domestic task. Water is used for cooking and doing the laundry. And that is woman's work. In the United States, both men and women work, but far too often yet, when she gets home, she still has to cook the dinner and pick up the house and do the laundry and make the beds and pack the school lunches for the next day alone. Which is why feminists say, it's the housework, stupid. <laughs> <laughs> so that their daughters may someday live a more balanced, more equal life. Clearly, the notion of woman as domestic servant is yet a universal expectation, a universal reality. When male workers demanded secretarial pools and parking spots, sick days, and paid vacation time, workers argued and owners agreed that these facilities were essential to the productivity of the worker and to the quality of the work. But when women ask companies to provide daycare centers on site, they're told that childcare has nothing to do with our business or the work environment or the quality of work the woman does. So as a result, the cost of childcare either prohibits a woman from entering the workforce at all or it eats up whatever profit she might make by doing it. And we wonder, our type, sit around and wonder why poor women stay poor? And child raising rather than public service stays a, a, a woman's job? And men live distanced from the home and marriages fail? Clearly, the controlling attitude here, as in every other case, is that women are caretakers but men are the authorities, the leaders, the controllers, and the public intellectuals of the world. When an intelligent woman figures these things out, brutally apparent in other countries perhaps, cleverly masked here, then suddenly she realizes the feminist agendas are definitely no longer passe. When children were being impressed into rogue militias in at least seven countries, Uganda, the DRC, Sudan, Chad, Kenya, Libya, Libya rather, and the Ivory Coast, both boys and girls impressed into, into service under the age of 15, the boys were trained to rape. And the girls were used as sex slaves to satisfy the soldiers themselves. But, Women lawyers pressing the case told me the sex crimes against girl soldiers were not even included in the statement of war crimes, let alone heard in court later. One case, one case, pressed by these women lawyers for over five years, from 2006 to 2011, has been heard by the International Criminal Court and finally prosecuted while well, thousands and thousands and thousands of girl children have been, the court records say, quote, raped, used as sex slaves, become pregnant, had unwanted children, were made to sleep with their commanders and do household chores, and then were used as well in combat, close quotes. In the United States of America, women and girls, kidnapped or penniless, bought and sold, are trafficked from one state to another, from a foreign country to this one in overwhelming numbers. UNESCO, the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, reports that trafficking two and a half million human beings across borders yearly is the new slavery. Over 20,000 women and girls a year are brought to the United States under pretense of good employment, which turns into sex work without any pay at all. Trapped, they're here, trapped, without money, without papers or passports. They're controlled by drugs and beatings and confinement. Some of them, as young as 12, sleep with eight to 10 men a night. 
They live in dingy walk-up rooms on the streets of New York and Los Angeles. They're isolated, they're beaten, and they're controlled by pimps. But the United States has yet to sign the international treaty which requires international sanctions for this inhuman practice. And what have you and I said about it any place? And why, why, why can this happen in this country in the face of all of our language about equality and justice? Don't ever again, ever allow anyone in your presence to call prostitution a woman's oldest profession. It is not, and it never has been, a woman's profession. Prostitution is the only profession men allowed women to have in early history, and it is still a male profession. Men pimp it, men profit from it, and men take pleasure in it. Clearly, when the buying and selling of women for sexual services is finally stopped by the men of this world, when domestic violence is seen as the sin, the insanity, the intolerable crime, the human indecency it is, then feminism may well be about to be passe. Until then, it remains a social scar on an overrated civilization, a disease of human underdevelopment that is sustained by the attitude that sex is all that a woman is really worth. In Afghanistan, male clergy propose again that the government reinstitute restrictive measures on the lives of women that will segregate the sexes and bar women from leaving their homes unless accompanied by a close male relative. In a traffic jam in Egypt two months ago, I looked out a, bu a bus window on the, on the cars coming by us on both sides. I saw only one woman driver in the whole lot. Women there are outraged at the rising return to restrictions by religious leaders. But the truth is that women of all faiths, in churches, mosques, or temples everywhere, are subject to the religious definitions and prescriptions and segregation of men and women in holy places. They're denied. Yes. <laughs> They are denied access yet to the forums where theological dictums are written that affect their lives. They're excluded even from the language of the faith where God is male and women are invisible. They're denied access to the central mysteries of their religion and the attitudes that sustain such things is a clear but increasingly suspect one. It's because God wants it that way. <laughs> like the little girl camel who figured out she'd been given webbed toes, water humps, and eyelashes, are we to believe that the God who gave women hearts, souls, and brains just like men's never meant to use them? <laughs> that kind of theology makes God a sexist. <laughs> It's a sad situation indeed, with the words, let us make them in our own image, male and female, let us make them, ringing in your ears, when even the soul of a woman is controlled by men. It's tragic when the bodies of women are controlled by men. It's unconscionable when the development of theology is denied the spiritual insights of women, and women are denied the fullness of the faith. It is heresy. It is heresy at the ultimate level, and it is as fresh as yesterday's fiction. Indeed, the underlying attitudes that bind the women of the world everywhere to female servitude are chilling. There are 11 of them. Woman is less fully human than a man. A woman is uncontrollably sexual. A woman's purpose is to serve men. A woman who's assaulted has asked for it. 
A woman is equal, but she just doesn't work hard enough or isn't smart enough to merit recognition. Childbearing and sexual satisfaction of a husband are God's only real will for women. The public arena is the male domain. His housework is woman's work. Women are caretakers, men are leaders. A woman is worthless for anything but sex, and most of all, God wants it this way. <laughs> the list is discouraging, yes. It's depressing, yes. It's disgraceful, yes. But it is not final. Only you can make it final. It is not fatal. It simply depends on us, women and men alike, to change it. And we know it can be done because history is full of the proof of it. When women decide to change something, it changes. When mama ain't happy, nobody's happy. You know these women. And if you don't know these women, ask yourself why it is that no one thought that these women were important enough to teach you about. When Mother Jones decided to stop the oppression of workers by starting a labor union, that oppression ended. A U.S. congressman called her at the age of 90, quote, the most dangerous woman in America. <laughs> Her motto was, pray for the dead and fight like hell for the living. <laughs> when Rachel Carson wanted the exploitation of nature to stop, she wrote her groundbreaking book, Silent Spring, and became a prime catalyst of what we now call the U.S. environmental movement. When Lillian Smith, a southern white woman, wanted to stop racism, she challenged local segregationists by organizing multiracial gatherings of artists and thinkers in the center of the South. Elizabeth Blackwell was refused admission to medical schools everywhere, so she studied medicine under the guidance of a private tutor and was eventually certified by a very small, inconspicuous medical school in Geneva, New York. However, when no hospital anywhere would hire her, she and her blood sister began a clinic in the slums of New York City, which became the first medical college for women, though we did not have a woman doctor in my hometown for another 100 years. Rose Snyderman was a key figure in demanding such reforms as the eight-hour day and the minimum wage she changed life for every woman and every man in this room, one way or another. Marie Stokes opened England's first birth control clinic in 1921 against intense opposition from both religious and medical establishments that called even public discussion of contraception a monstrous crime. Lucky us, we haven't heard of anything like that. <laughs> The list is endless. Mary Cassatt raised the stature of female artists. Nellie Bly was one of the first, quote, girl reporters in the United States, and she took on such volatile subjects as the problems of working women. And at her death, they eulogized her as the best reporter in America. These women made inroads for other women, for the human race everywhere. In our, in our own time today, there is Aung San Suu Kyi, who unmask Burmese oppression. There's a brave child lying tonight, Malala, with a shot in her head for insisting on the education of girls in Pakistan. And there are the sisters of the Leadership Conference of Women Religious who claim the right. <laughs> their own organization, articulate their own ideas, and pursue their own questions without male permission. <laughs> All of these women refused to take no for an answer, and by doing that, made it possible for other women never to hear no again about their own place and agency in the issues of the time. 
They refused to silence their humanity and so made the fullness of your humanity and mine possible. They did not say when they themselves reached the pinnacle of their own aspirations, feminism is over now, it's so passe, it's unimportant, it's boring, it's dangerous, it's disturbing. Their lives say to us, go on you, you go on, yes. Yes, go to the stars, go to the peak of your personal possibilities, but do not under any conditions fail to take other women with you and never ever deride or derail their own attempts. Do not fail to listen to their needs. Do not fail to understand that their needs are still your needs. As long as one woman is still denied, excluded and unheard by any system, by any institution, by whatever theologies of domination, because she is a woman, we are all oppressed. And our daughters, whoever they are, whatever country they're in tonight, whatever they seek to be but are denied, are not free, will never be free without you and me. No, feminism is not passe. The only question now for our own time is are we equal? not only to its present demands, but to the women who went before us, who made the world we live in, who left us with a better world, who never felt for a moment that because oppression was over for them, that it was over for every woman everywhere, and so they spent their lives to make it so. The essayist Leo Rostan wrote, the purpose of life is not to be happy. The purpose of life is to matter to have it make a difference, that you lived it all. And Teilhard de Chardin writes, the only task worthy of our efforts is to construct the future. That's why this subject, this forum, this night, and all nights like it are so important to every woman and every man in this hall, to every young man and woman everywhere. It's a sign and symbol, not only of what can be, but of what must be if we are all to be fully human, human beings together. Remember, dear friends, time changes nothing. People do. It's our time now. For the sake of our daughters, for the sake of the world, we must each do something to make a better future, to make a difference for women everywhere, so that all of us can become what we are truly meant to be, men of conscience and women of courage. I want to congratulate the Women of Spirit and the Westminster Town Hall Forum tonight for by the vision that airing this issue models, you are making a better history for us all. God bless you. Thank you, Joan Chittister. You're listening to a special presentation sponsored by Women's Spirit and the Westminster Town Hall Forum broadcast from Westminster Presbyterian Church on Nicollet Mall in downtown Minneapolis. My name is Tim Hart Anderson. I'm the senior minister at Westminster Presbyterian Church and moderator of this forum with Sister Joan Chittister. While the ushers collect questions from the in-house audience, I'd like to invite the radio audience to join us for a post-election forum on Thursday, November 29th at noon, when political strat strategist Donna Brazil will discuss the recent election and the challenges facing our next president. And now, Sister Joan Tittiser, if you would return to the pulpit, I will present the questions from our audience. Go ahead, it's washable. <laughs> as long as we're... We're speaking about the election there. American Magazine, America Magazine recently asked the two Catholic vice presidential candidates a question that perhaps you would answer. Uh, 
if you had five minutes with the Pope, what would you say to him? I would say, I come here to speak for women. We have one short message. You're overdue. <laughs> overdue. Is 2,000 years tippy-toe enough for us? <laughs> Where can we make the most impact for equality and justice? What groups are making a difference? Well, in my opinion, every group makes a difference. And I don't prioritize them. And I don't care how large they are or how small they are. I'm just begging you to find your interest, follow your interest, discover how it affects women. And through that group who have the organization, the voice, and the public arena uh, to respond to it. It may be through education, it may be through environment. Women are suffering terribly from the lack of environmental protection. You heard that tonight, surely. Um, there are obviously women's groups and that's, uh, that should be supported. I certainly support them. At the same time, I'm looking for termites who will invest in every other group. <laughs> and bring up the forbidden subject, you know, like this if necessary, but bring it up. <laughs> Let them know that that subject touches their group, whatever it is, you're already in those groups. Just simply ask them what they're doing to bring women to full stature and independence and education in this country. Which country or countries has or have the best living conditions for women? Is Denmark not near the top? And yes. speaking as a Dane, I hope so. Yes. Yeah. You're, you're, <laughs> uh, well, you'll be happy to know that uh, if you want to see me afterwards, I'm carrying uh, the uh, the, glo the report of the global uh, forum on on um, gender. And uh, yes, Iceland, Finland, Norway, Sweden. Ireland is fifth, New Zealand, Denmark, the Philippines, Nicaragua, Switzerland, Netherlands, Belgium, Germany, Lesotho, Latvia, South Africa, Luxembourg, the United Kingdom, Cuba, and Austria all rank ahead of us. Did you mention the United States in that list? No, I didn't. That was the top 20, and we're 22nd. Can you tell us something about your work with the Global Peace Initiative of Women? Yes, the Global Peace Initiative of Women came out of the Millennium Summit in 2000. It was, it's a very interesting personal kind of story. Um, at that summit, uh, then General Secretary of the United Nations recognized that everybody, he had, he, he had the vision to recognize that if we were gonna have a different millennium next time around, that religious figures and religious leaders had to commit to that. So he had a religious summit and noticed that, uh, well, uh, the women noticed that I think there were less than 100 women in 2,000 men. And women who, who are carrying all these institutions on their backs, who do all the house visiting and take care of all the sick and, and, and handle all the chanceries and, and deal with, with all the churches, they weren't there. So uh, he, was, he was very concerned about that, a good, honest man. And uh, he set about creating a woman's summit that we held in, uh, in Switzerland, in Geneva. And at the end of that summit, the women created the Women's Global Peace Initiative. And it was set up around uh, figures whose faces were known in their own denominations. And we had a Buddhist nun, and an Islamic scholar, and a Hindu nun, and a uh, Protestant ordained woman whom you know very well, Joan Brown Campbell, and uh, a Jewish rabbi and this erstwhile Catholic nun. And what they did, <laughs> what we decided to do was to go into areas of tension or great deprivation and bring people together around these subjects. Uh, we are now uh, kind of 
uh, morphing into the creation of another group calling for the voice of contemplatives. Uh, you know, people are funny. People look at religion, they, they look at your types, and they say, well... <laughs> I knew it would get to this point. Yeah. <laughs> They'll say something like, well, yes, they're very good, you know, they do all sorts of good things, but, but really, those are the real religious ones are hiding in somebody's shack someplace called a hermitage or a monastery or something. They're the real ones. So what we are saying and what any real contemplative says, what is a contemplative? A contemplative is someone who sees the world as God sees the world. You are meant to be as contemplative as I am. Otherwise, who was Jesus walking from Galilee to Jerusalem, stopping at, at every pain in the, in the entire area and changing that pain, saving that pain, raising that person? So what we're doing now is asking contemplatives to raise their voices and tell us, tell the rest of, of the world what they see as, as uh, barriers to peace and justice and goodness. Sometimes I think I'm really weird for working in the Catholic Church as a woman. <laughs> what sustains you? Uh, weird, I don't know. Holy, I think. Um, <laughs> Well, you know, my faith, the Jesus story sustains me. My woman's community sustains me. Uh, we go back, we're Benedictines, and we're the oldest religious order in the Catholic Church. There's no institution older in the Catholic Church than the Church itself. And so we have, we have weathered every change in the human agenda in the West for over 1,500 years. We are not going down on this one. Can you, can you say more about how the rule of Benedict has shaped your spirituality, your life? Well, I think that's pretty clear. The rule of Benedict is probably one of the simplest rules in the history of the church, quite mystical piece itself. And what it's really talking about is how to live an ordinary life extraordinarily well. Uh, the rule of Benedict, the Benedictines have no particular ministry. And you know, you can look at some religious orders and say, well, they're a nursing order. Or you look at, they're a teaching order. Or they're a missionary order. No, Benedictines are good for nothing. <laughs> Except living life just as happily as you can and as fruitfully and, and carefully as you can. So uh, that is the basic spirituality. It's living well. The, I, I have written a book in which I call Benedictine and Spirituality the spirituality of the 21st century because its concentration is on things like community and peace and justice and, and uh, hospitality and and, and uh, the human uh, dimensions of life. If we don't get back to those soon, there's not gonna be much life left for any of us. Joan, did you realize that Minnesota is one of the top states for human trafficking? Maybe this audience does not realize that, and tonight will inspire Minnesota women to become involved with this issue. Thank you for your commitment and energy on women's behalf. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are you still doing questions? We've got one more. OK. Uh, tell us, as you travel around, as you meet with groups like this, or deal with the church and the controversies there in the political arena and the polarization in our nation, are you hopeful? Oh, nothing but hopeful. Because I know what people want. I know where the hearts are. I can see the, the institutions that bar and block and suppress them. But someday, the, peop the heart of the people is going to break through. It has in every generation, and it will now, and it is now. Just join the crowd.
Thank you, Sister Joan Chinister.